Leading today's presentation is Dr. Adele Diamond, a leader in two fields, psychology and neuroscience. Dr. Diamond helped pioneer the now flourishing interdisciplinary field called developmental cognitive neuroscience and is one of the foremost experts on executive functions. Dr. Diamond studies how executive functions are affected by biological factors, such as genes and neurochemistry, and by environmental ones, for example, impaired by stress or improved by effective programs or interventions. Her work has helped change medical practice for the treatment of PKU and for the inattentive type of ADHD and has impacted early education worldwide. Professor Diamond was named one of the 2000 Outstanding Women of the 20th Century and was recently listed as one of the 15 most influential neuroscientists alive today. She was educated at Swarthmore, where she received her BA, Phi Beta Kappa, Harvard for her PhD, and Yale, where she was a postdoc. Before I hand over the microphone to Dr. Diamond, I have just a few housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you receive around an hour after the live broadcast. If you are listening in replay or podcast mo mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 383 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. And if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from a greater understanding of ADHD. Finally, the sponsor of this week's webinar is Accentrate. Accentrate is a dietary supplement formulated to address nutritional deficiencies known to be associated with ADHD. It contains omega-3 fatty, fatty acids in phospholipid form, the form, form already in the brain, unlike fish oil. This brain-ready nutrition helps manage inattention, lack of focus, emotional dysregulation, and hyperactivity without drug-like side effects. Visit www.phoenix, that's F-E-N-I-X, phoenixhealthscience.com to learn more about it. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Diamond. Thanks so much for joining us today and leading this discussion. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. First, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the ancestral unceded territories of the wonderful Coast Salish peoples, especially the Musqueam. My specialty is executive functions. Executive functions have been described as the mental toolkit for success. Indeed, they're often been found to be more predictive of academic and career success than socioeconomic status or IQ. Executive functions refers to a family of mental processes needed whenever going on automatic or relying on instinct or intuition would not be a good idea. There are three core executive functions and I'll go through them in turn. Inhibitory control at the level of attention is focused attention or selective attention. Being able to inhibit distraction so you can focus and stay focused. The ability to concentrate, pay attention and stay focused despite distractions, even when the material is boring. And during COVID, many of us had a master class in trying to exercise focused attention as we tried to work from home with all of the many distractions at home. What activity might someone do or might a parent or teacher have children do to try to improve focused attention? To improve any executive function, it's critical to keep practicing that executive function. It's the discipline, the practice that produces the benefits. Not only that, but executive functions need to be continually challenged to see improvements, not just used, 
but challenged. And that's true for being excellent at anything. Um, Erickson spent his entire career studying ex uh, experts in all different fields. And what he found is it didn't matter whether it was chess or dance or whatever. What matters is the hours of practice and keep pushing yourself to improve. Um, that's what drives the benefits. So what activities challenge focused attention? Walking on a log, for example, in the woods. Uh, here's a dad helping his daughter do that, scaffolding it. So the daughter is walking across the log, but she probably couldn't do it if dad wasn't giving her confidence and, and supporting her a little bit. So scaffolding is helping you do something that you're not quite able to do on your own yet without that help. Uh, for children too young to be able to walk on a log, walking on a line on the ground is as difficult for them as for you and I to walk on a balance beam. It takes a lot of focused attention. And then when you're good at it, you can make it harder. So you can do it with something on your head, um, race with an egg and a spoon, dance with something on your head. All of these things work on balance and focusing your attention. Um, another thing you can do is have everybody get a bell. You can follow the most dysregulated person in the room. The rule is that nobody should make a sound with their bell. It takes focused attention. It's excellent practice. It's also good for calming down. Helping with kitchen chores or other household chores can train the executive function of focused attention. It takes a lot of concentration to get the, the thread in the eye of the needle or for a young child to pour liquid. And doing these tasks helps to develop fine and gross motor skills in addition to training, focused attention and concentration. Let your toddler help set the table or do other household chores. Young children love to do adult chores and your faith that they can contribute means the world to them. It's a general principle that motor development and cognitive development are fundamentally intertwined. Doing these household chores helps find motor skills and helps focus attention. Uh, beating, for example, is another wonderful thing for focused attention. Juggling, there are so many activities that you can do in regular life, don't cost a lot of money and help you work on attention. Singing a song as a round. Inhibitory control uh, at the level of behavior is self-control or response inhibition. Resisting temptations, not acting impulsively, the think before you speak or act. Self-control saves us from putting our foot in our mouth or making a social faux pas. Think of all the trouble you'd get in if you told your boss what you really thought of him or her. Grab whatever you wanted without asking or paying or did other socially inappropriate or hurtful things. If we want to change, if we want to mend our ways, we need self-control. Discipline and perseverance also require inhibitory control because they require re resisting all the many temptations to quit and not finish what you started. Maybe you're really bored with it. Maybe you're really frustrated with it because you ran into all kinds of problems you didn't expect. Certainly, there are more fun things you could be doing. Continuing to work, though the reward may be a long time in coming, requires inhibitory control, discipline and perseverance. It's tempting to jump to a quick conclusion about why a child didn't do what he or she was supposed to do. But we need to exercise self-control and humility. We might be wrong. People have assumed that if children knew what they should do, they would do it. If they didn't, they were intentionally misbehaving. But between knowing and implementing, another step long ignored is often needed. When there's a strong competing response, that response must be inhibited. A child may not be able to do that. So a child may know what he or she should do and sincerely want to do that, but still not be able to act accordingly. It's not that the child is a bad kid. It's not that the child is a discipline problem. It's that the child doesn't have sufficient inhibitory control yet. My husband has ADHD. And when he was in grade school, he was told he was lazy. He was told he was stupid. And none of that is true. My husband is brilliant. He's one of the most creative people I know. 
we often jump to the wrong conclusion about why somebody hasn't done something. We need to exercise inhibitory control and wait and find out more information. What might someone do or a parent or teacher have children do to try to improve inhibitory control of behavior, self-control, or to scaffold that, to help support that? Well, games like Simon Says help you practice inhibitory control at any age. Um, uh, doing dramatic acting, you have to inhibit acting out of character. Or if you're playing music with others, you have to wait until it's your turn to play. When doing a comic routine, try not to laugh at your own jokes. Um, the, a program called um, Tools of the Mind has preschoolers or kindergarten children. All of them get a, a, one of their favorite books, get in a pair with another child, and take turns telling the story that goes with the picture in the book. Well, everybody is all excited to tell their story, and nobody wants to be the listener. So what they do in Tools of the Mind is they give one child in each pair a picture of an ear, and that helps the child remember that her role right now is to listen. So with that, she's able to listen. Without that, she wouldn't be able to. Um, another thing you can do to, to support yourself with inhibitory control is to hide fattening food in the back of the fridge or the cupboard. You don't have to have it in your face all the time to be taxing your inhibitory control more. Working memory is the second core executive function, holding information in mind to work or play with it. You need that to mentally play with ideas and relate one idea to another, reflect on the past or consider the future, remember multi-step instructions and execute them in the right order, and remember a question you want to ask as you're listening to the ongoing conversation. Working memory is critical for making sense of anything that unfolds over time, for that always requires holding in mind what happened earlier and relating that to what's happening now. So it's obvious for oral language, because you're not hearing what was said earlier, you have to hold that in mind. But it's also true for reading, because you're not seeing what you read earlier, you have to hold that in mind to be able to relate it to what you're reading now. What might someone do, or a parent or teacher have children do, to try to improve working memory? Well, a fun game for practicing working memory and thus improving it is to have one person start a story, and then go around the room with each person repeating the story up to that point and adding another sentence or detail. Doing mental math problems is another excellent way to practice working memory, such as calculating bowling scores, especially when there's strikes and spares, or calculating whether you have enough cash on hand for all the items you want to buy. I predict that a great way to improve children's auditory attention and working memory is simply to tell them stories. And I'm a huge fan of storytelling. Storytelling requires and invites your rapt attention for extended periods, sustained, focused attention, and working memory to hold in mind everything that's happened so far, the different characters' identities, the story details, and relating that to the new information you're getting. Without the aid of pictures on the page or puppets acting it out, without any visual aid, you just have the spoken word. A researcher randomly assigned children in kindergarten and grade one to storytelling or story reading. In storytelling, the teacher had the book in front of her, but she tried not to look down so much. She tried to maintain eye contact with the children, and she never turned the pages around to show the children the beautiful pictures. Story reading was as you, as you normally do. You're looking down mostly to read, and after you finished each page, you turn it around so the children can see the beautiful pictures. And what the researcher found is that both vocabulary and recall improved more in the children assigned to storytelling than the children assigned to story reading. And that's important because vocabulary assessed at age three strongly predicts reading comprehension at nine to 10 years of age. A high school student, Edith Backman, recently completed a study with me where she looked at storytelling versus story reading by fourth graders. The fourth graders were both the listeners and the story conveyors. They read the story or they told it. And what she found is that storytelling improved auditory sustained attention more than story reading. While story reading is wonderful and I encourage you to read to your children, 
I predict that you should also do storytelling because it should improve attention and working memory more because it taxes them more. So I'm also a fan of poetry slam, spoken word for the same reason. They're excellent for training working memory and attention. The third core executive function is cognitive flexibility. Seeing an issue from different perspectives, thinking about something in a whole new way, seamlessly adjusting to change or the unexpected. Instead of focusing on your child's weaknesses, what he or she is not good at, you can use cognitive flexibility to switch perspectives and focus on his or her strengths, the ways he or she is absolutely amazing. Instead of worrying about the future, we can use our cognitive flexibility to switch to focusing on and enjoying the present. By the way, you can also use cognitive flexibility so you don't focus on your own weaknesses, but the ways in which you are absolutely amazing. Cognitive flexibility also includes having the flexibility to take advantage of a sudden opportunity, get around an unexpected problem, or even to admit you were wrong when you get more information. If there's a problem you haven't been able to solve, can you think outside the box to conceive of the problem, frame the problem in a whole new way, come up with a completely different way of attacking it? Alexander Graham Bell gave a great example of poor cognitive flexibility when he said, when one door closes, another door opens. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the ones that open for us. What might someone do or a parent or teacher have children do to try to improve cognitive flexibility? Any kind of improvisation does that. Improvisational theater, improvisational dance, jazz, they are unsurpassed for encouraging and nurturing creativity, flexibly adjusting on the fly to whatever happens to be happening. You can make a game of trying to come up with creative, crazy, unusual uses for everyday objects like a table. So what crazy, outside the box things can you do with a table? I mean, obviously you can eat your food from a table, you can write on a table, but what unusual things can you do with a table? Well, you could hide under it, for example. You could turn it on its side to project you for, protect you from things people are throwing at you. Turn it upside down to play horseshoes, use it as a percussion instrument, cut it up for firewood. Just an exercise in creativity or a game of trying to find commonalities between an everyday thing and other everyday things. For example, in what way is a carrot like a cucumber? Maybe now you're focusing on shape, they're both long. How is it like an orange? Maybe now you focus on color. How is it like a potato? Maybe now you focus on where they grow underground. How is it like an apple? Maybe you're focusing now moving out and saying they're both foods. Again, just different ways to think about carrots. The best way, though, I think, is to invite your children to help you solve a real problem that you are genuinely not sure how to solve. Invite them to think outside the box to come up with creative solutions. They'll love the challenge and will feel great pride in helping an adult and being asked to contribute. And this can make your life a little easier. You don't have to come up with all the solutions yourself. This practice in working on problems and finding solutions is invaluable. Children get in the habit of thinking outside the box, of looking at something from various perspectives, and, and of seeing problems as solvable. Can you think of any activity that requires all three core executive functions, challenging and training all three? Well, for young children, one example is social pretend play, like uh, doctor and patient or cops and robbers. You have to hold in mind what role you picked and what role the others picked. Right. So if you're planning the robbery, you don't want to accidentally tell the cop that would be disastrous. You have to inhibit acting out of character. So if you pick that you're the baby in a family scenario, you can't all of a sudden get up and drive the fancy family car. You have to stay in character. And the kids you're playing with may take that scenario in ways you never imagined. So on the fly, in real time, you have to flexibly adjust to what's happening in that play. It works all three core executive functions. Critical executive function skills like creative problem solving, focus, attention, self-control, working memory, and cognitive flexibility can all be taught and practiced through the arts, 
sports, wilderness survival, woodworking, cooking, taking care of an animal. Each of these activities requires planning, cognitive flexibility to respond to unexpected reactions or difficulties, perseverance even in the face of setbacks or initial failure, creative problem solving, indeed all of the executive functions. I think it's so sad that we dichotomize academic activities and other or enrichment activities because the enrichment activities like sports or the arts work all the cognitive skills that a school wants to improve. And they're a lot more fun than, than boring classes. Have children do activities they love. If those activities challenge problem solving, focused attention, etc., those activities should improve those skills more than a class the children find boring. For executive function skills or anything else though, people improve on the skills they practice. And that transfers to very similar contexts where those same skills are needed. But people only improve on what they practice. Improvement does not transfer to other skills. Transfer is narrow. That means if you want to improve executive functions, like focused attention, self-control, et cetera, and you want them to generalize from an arts or sports activity to academic activities, you need to help students see that whatever they did in arts or sports applies to the academic subjects. You need to draw very explicit analogies for students. Don't assume that since it's obvious to you how a skill used in music applies to science, that it will be obvious to the students. There's been a lot of interest in computerized cognitive training. Computerized working memory training improves working memory. But the results have genuinely been disappointing with narrow benefits that fade away in a year or less. CogMed is the computerized method for training working memory with the most and the strongest evidence. Across all methods of computerized cognitive training, CogMed is the only method to consistently show sustained benefits up to one year, but not up to two. Even for CogMed though, only about half of the studies have found even suggestive evidence of transfer to any skill other than what the people trained on in CogMed. And less than 30% of the studies have found any clear evidence of transfer to any other skill. A randomized control trial of CogMed in Australia found that working memory improvement was still robust one year later, but was gone two years later. And those who were trained on CogMed performed worse in math two years later than others who, tr who received regular classroom teaching instead of CogMed. Despite intensive marketing of CogMed is beneficial to children with ADHD, the evidence is stronger for CogMed benefiting typically developing children than children with ADHD. In short, computerized working memory training improves working memory but that does not generalize to other skills like self-control, intelligence, creativity, or flexibility. Transfer is narrow. Now I'd like to take a step back for a minute. In my opinion, there's been too much focus on what activity to have people do to improve their executive functions and too little focus on a person's state of mind. Folks spend a lot of money trying to improve their executive functions and companies make a lot of money from computerized training regimens. But the best way to improve executive functions is to believe in yourself and your ability to improve your executive functions. To relax, reduce the stress in your life or how stressed you feel about it, and increase the joy in your life. Children need to believe in themselves. They need to believe they can and will succeed. And that's half the battle. If they believe they can, they probably will. If they don't believe they can, they definitely won't. There are two roots to a child believing in him or herself. Children need to know that you believe in them and fully expect them to succeed. Just one person believing in you, believing in your potential can make all the difference. With hope and the possibility of success can come the courage not to give up. A Gallup poll study of over 70,000 students in the US found that the hope 
children in grades 5 to 12 had for themselves predicted their college grades and college success better than did their high school grades or standardized test scores. We need to communicate loud and clear to a young person the faith and expectation that that person will find his or her way. Focus on a child's strengths rather than harping on his or her weaknesses or failings. Our expectations for a child have a huge effect on the expectations that child develops for him or herself. And the expectations children have for themselves can become self-fulfilling prophecies. In social psychology, there's a little cottage industry in a subfield called stereotype threat. There are many stereotypes in our culture. One of the stereotypes is that in general, men are better at math than women. So a group of researchers went to a university, gave a standardized math test, and no surprise, as a group, the male students scored better than the female students. Then the researchers took exactly the same test to a completely comparable group of university students. They only changed one thing. This time, before they gave the test, they said, this particular test has been designed to be gender neutral. On this particular test, women score as well as men. And what did they find? The women scored as well as the men. It was the same test. The only difference was the expectations the women had for themselves. What if we told ADHD children that a particular test was designed to be ADHD friendly? On this particular test, those with ADHD score as well or better than those without ADHD. What if we told ADHD children that ADHD is an advantage for X, Y, and Z reasons, and we know they'll be able to succeed in life. Ned Hollowell has emphasized that approach. In Breen Brown's research, only one thing separated those who were in loving relationships from those who were not. It was simply that those in loving relationships believed they were worthy of love and belonging. That's all. They had the courage to be imperfect, the compassion to be kind to themselves. Similarly, Similarly, believing that you're capable of doing well at cognitive tasks, that you can improve how well you do, is key to your doing well and improving. Your behavior and the fruits of that will follow from your expectations. The second route to children believing in themselves is to give them doable challenges. They need opportunities to do things that enable them to see for themselves that they're capable. It does not help a child to, to make things easy for the child, to say, you know, I don't want to take a chance on you getting hurt. I don't want to take a chance on you being disappointed. I'm going to make it easy. I'm going to make it protective for you. They need to see that they can do something that really was hard. Pride, self-confidence, and joy coming from seeing yourself succeed at something that you know was difficult. Real-world activities like the arts and sports give children repeated experience that through effort and repeated practice, what looked impossible becomes possible even easy. It teaches them that if you keep trying, you can do it. And then you go to the next level and it looks impossible and you keep trying and then it's easy. Of course I can do it. Seeing themselves repeatedly conquering those challenges builds confidence. Show children you believe in them by giving them an important responsibility. This study is called the Coca-Cola study because Coca-Cola funded it. There was a school where the, there were several fifth grade boys who were terrible behavior problems and terrible readers. And the school administration, the principal, went to the those troublemaker boys and said, I have a very important responsibility for you. This is very serious. I need you to tutor the second graders who are struggling in reading. He couldn't ask them to tutor the third graders because they didn't read so much better than the third graders, but they read better than the second graders. Well, in short order, the behavior problems disappeared. And by the end of the school year, not only were the second graders reading better, but those fifth grade boys were reading better. Be patient. Give your child the time and space to figure out how to solve a problem on his or her own. Stress impacts executive functions and prefrontal cortex on which they depend sooner and more severely than any other brain region. Executive functions depend on prefrontal cortex and the other neural regions with which it's interconnected. Prefrontal cortex is the newest area of the brain over the course of evolution and the most vulnerable. 
If anyone is sad or stressed, lonely or not physically fit, prefrontal cortex and executive functions are the first to suffer and suffer the most. Stress impairs executive functions and can cause anyone to look as if that person has an executive function impairment, like ADHD, when that's not the case. You may have noticed that when you're stressed, you can't think as clearly or exercise as good self-control. When you're stressed, your ADHD looks much, much worse. When I'm stretched, I reach for the chocolate. My self-control goes out the window. Creativity requires that one feel relaxed enough to be playful. Children need to feel safe if they're to push the limits of what they know, venture into the unknown, take the risk of making a mistake or being wrong. Corporations want creativity. They're looking for people who can think outside the box. Many of us were taught that people perform better on challenging cognitive tests when they're slightly stressed, a bit on edge, rather than when they're calm. Uh, lots of people talk about that a certain mild level of stress is positive, like the Harvard Center for the Developing Child. But is stress, even if mild, ever really a good thing for one's executive functions? Some of the neurobiological reasons for why prefrontal cortex is so vulnerable to the effects of stress, even mild stress, include these. Stress disrupts functional communication between prefrontal cortex and other brain regions. A few weeks of stress in preparation for a major exam disrupts communication between prefrontal cortex and other brain regions and impairs executive function. That comes back. The communication and the executive functions come back when the stress is over, but during the stress, they're impaired. Normally, a brain region called the amygdala sends out alarm signals whenever there's any sign of danger in the environment, whenever there's any risk, one might be harmed. So it gets activated whenever you see an angry or fearful face. Now, um, uh, when you see a, a picture of a face, you're not really in danger. So when something like that happens, prefrontal cortex sends out a message to the amygdala that it can calm down. There's really no danger here. So the message from prefrontal cortex is what gets the amygdala to stop firing so much. There's an inverse relationship between prefrontal cortex activity and amygdala activity. So the amygdala activity increases when you see that uh, fearful face then prefrontal cortex activity comes in and amygdala activity goes down. So prefrontal is, is telling the amygdala it can calm down now. If the functional communication between prefrontal cortex and the amygdala is disrupted, however, the message from prefrontal cortex to inhibitory interneurons in the amygdala, the message from prefrontal cortex to calm, to calm down doesn't get through. So the amygdala keeps firing and you keep staying in a stress state. Reason two for why prefrontal cortex is particularly vulnerable to the effects of stress, even mild stress. Dopamine is a critically important neurotransmitter in prefrontal and in other brain regions. One unusual property of the dopamine system in prefrontal is that even mild stress increases the level of dopamine in prefrontal. So here you can see that the gray bar has only gone up in prefrontal, and that's in the case of mild stress. It's not going up in any other brain region. And prefrontal needs dopamine, but just like your car engine needs gasoline, if you, give, if you flood your car engine with gasoline, now it can't work properly. If you flood prefrontal cortex with dopamine, now it can't work properly. So even mild stress can impair prefrontal function by increasing dopamine too much in prefrontal cortex. Stress, even mild stress, increases the level of dopamine in prefrontal. Stress, even mild stress, impairs the executive functions of most people. Stress and anxiety, even if quite mild, only help a few and impair the executive functions of most. Perhaps we should rethink how beneficial stress ever really is. Feeling stressed because you're worried about what others might think of you or might think of your performance, social evaluative stress is not beneficial for executive functions. Performance anxiety is not beneficial. Evidence shows that pressure to perform well can be as detrimental to performance as intentionally imposing stress. There's a difference between the excitement and exhilaration of being challenged and the anxiety of feeling stressed. 
joy and the challenge of pushing one's limits are better motivators than fear or anxiety. If a student or employee is stressed, that person's performance will likely suffer. Reduce your child's level of stress. Your children need to know with absolute unshakable confidence that they can never do anything to, use, to lose your love for them, that you'll support them in their decisions even if you think they're wrong. They can count on you. You will always be there for them. We all need to feel there are people who care about us, believe in us, and will be there for us. A major source of stress for many children is feeling that they're not smart enough. Remember, it's important to communicate loud and clear the faith and expectation that, that, that each child certainly is smart enough and will be able to find his or her way and will be able to succeed. Young people are so terrified of making a mistake, they're afraid to try anything new. We need to let our youth know it's okay to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, even us. The only way to completely avoid mistakes is to stay with what you already know to stop growing. Because if you go beyond what you know, you don't know. You have a 50-50 chance of being right or wrong. If you want to be sure that you don't make a mistake, then you have to stay with what you already know. But then you're not growing, you're not learning. Einstein said anyone who's never made a mistake has never tried anything new. Making mistakes is part of learning and improving. We should celebrate when any child has the courage to try and challenge him or herself. Treating errors and failed attempts as learning opportunities or just part of improving has been demonstrated repeatedly to be important for improving and succeeding. Making a mistake is not a problem. Suffering embarrassment because you made a mistake is a problem. Children can't relax if they're worried you might embarrass them. It's important how someone reacts after they've made a mistake or fallen short of a goal. We need to emphasize to young people that they haven't failed until they've tried for the last time and they haven't lost until they quit. They haven't failed until they've tried for the last time. They haven't lost until they quit. Stress reduces include things like predictability, consistency, clear expectations, clarity about what is and is not permitted, stable routine, things in their place. All of these things reduce stress. Feeling rushed is stressful. Take it easy. Let a child take the time he or she needs. Showing compassion toward yourself relieves stress. Imperfect is not the same as worthless. You're going to make mistakes, and that's perfectly okay. You don't have to be perfect, and worrying about it is not going to help. The Western emphasis on self-reliance, not being dependent on anyone else, is wrong and destructive of your mental and physical health. It's okay to ask for help. It's a sign of wisdom, not weakness. Everyone needs help now and again. Touch relieves stress. These two babies were born prematurely, and the one on the left was not doing well. She had breathing and heart rate problems, didn't gain weight, and fussed when anyone tried to comfort her. Finally, against hospital regulations and doctor's orders, a nurse put the two together in the same incubator. And as the stressed baby dozed, the other baby on the right wrapped her arm around her smaller sibling. With her sister nearby, Brielle began to calm down and thrive. Sooner than expected, the girls went home. I'm a huge fan of hugging. Pets can reduce stress. Pets teach us about gentleness, patience, and never holding a grudge. They're our protector, our confidant. Stroking them is soothing for us. They love us unconditionally, as little in return, and don't even require eye contact. The presence of a dog in the classroom reduces stress and helps children pay attention and learn better. The presence of a dog at work reduces stress and helps people get more work done. Being out in nature relieves stress. Exercise in almost any form reduces stress. Mindfulness reduces stress. Movement-based mindfulness practices reduce stress. Um, together with a graduate student, Daphne Ling, we did the largest and most comprehensive review to date 
of all the different methods tried for improving executive functions and at all ages, children through the elderly. So these are some of the things we looked at, computerized cognitive training, non-computerized neurofeedback, promising school programs, sedentary mindfulness, mindfulness where you're moving more, yoga, uh, aerobic exercise, aerobic exercise with more cognitive demands, resistance training. To almost everyone's surprise, a relatively understudied approach, mindfulness practices involving movement like Tai Chi and Taekwondo showed by far the best results for improving executive functions of all the different methods tried. Now, there were only eight studies of mindfulness practices involving movement, and only two or three are any particular kind of practice. And often initial results look promising and then don't hold up. So just bear that in mind. But these four columns represent four different metrics for judging whether an approach worked or not. And across all four, mindful movement practices looked best. Second best was promising school programs and coming in third was the computerized cognitive training. Only for mindful movement practices did 100% of the studies, all the studies find at least suggestive evidence of executive function benefits. No other approach can claim anything close to that. And um, they showed much better results than any other kinds of physical activity without a mindfulness component. In fact, they showed really poor results and better than more sedentary mindfulness where there's less movement like mindfulness. A mindful movement practice can help you stay focused on the present moment. Activities such as Taekwondo, Tai Chi and Qigong can help you learn to control your breathing and thus control your arousal. Whether executive function gains are seen depends on the way an activity is done though. Lakes and Hoyt randomly assigned children in grades kindergarten through grade five to Taekwondo or standardized phys, phys ed. And what they find is the children assigned to Taekwondo show greater gains than children in standard phys ed mentions of executive functions they study. This generalized to multiple contexts and was found on multiple measures. Traditional martial arts emphasize self-control, discipline, and character development. For example, don't immediately go in for your opponent Weight for your opponent is slightly off balance. Maybe he's starting to go for you. And now go in and take the advantage now that he's slightly not, not fully balanced. In a study with adolescent juvenile delinquents, one group was assigned to traditional Taekwondo and the other group was assigned to modern martial arts. Taekwondo just as a physical activity or a competitive sport. And what they found is that those in traditional Taekwondo showed less aggression and anxiety and improved in social ability and self-esteem. But those in modern martial arts showed more juvenile delinquency and aggressiveness and decreased self-esteem and social ability. The different parts of the human being are fundamentally interrelated. Each part, cognitive, spiritual, social, emotional, and physical is affected by and affects the others. We have to care about children's emotional, social, spiritual, and physical well-being if we want them to be able to problem solve, exercise self-control, or creatively solve problems and meet life's challenges. Supporting all the aspects of a person, emotional, social, and physical, may be key to seeing executive function benefits and seeing them last. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks so much. That was wonderful. Really, very insightful. Um, a lot of good questions. Um, a lot of them I was going to ask, but you answered them in your slide um, show here. So uh, I will go to some others. Does menopause um, impair executive function in women with ADHD? That's a great question. There's been some research that reduced estrogen impairs working memory, whether you have ADHD or not. So there's some evidence that menopause and post-menopause does impair uh, working memory. And in aging, all of our executive functions get worse, whether we have ADHD or not, whether we're a man or a woman. So um, my executive functions are not as good as they used to be. Mm -hmm. Here's one that's sort of out of left field, but I was intrigued by it. Could crocheting help executive function? 
absolutely. <laughs> Anything where you have to concentrate and pay attention will do it. The most important thing is the person enjoy the activity because you want to increase joy in your life. And if you enjoy the activity, you're going to spend more time at it and you're going to push yourself to get better at it. So crocheting or anything else you love doing that requires attention, requires um, cognitive flexibility when you when something unexpected happens, requires working memory, remembering the pattern you wanted. Mm -hmm. All of that is fantastic for improving executive functions. Great question. And uh, what about medication, ADHD medication? Does it help, hinder, um, does it fall in between? Um, does it do anything for executive function? That's a great question. It, it can help. It can also hinder. Because the optimal level of dopamine and prefrontal is an intermediate level, and stimulants affect the level of dopamine. So um, the level... Without getting into the complicated neurobiology, mm -hmm. the uh, 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 relatively moderate, medium, or high dose of stimulant will inhibit reuptake of dopamine by a uh, dopamine transporter. Now, there's a lot of dopamine transporter in the striatum, but very little dopamine transporter in prefrontal cortex. So doses of stimulant that are higher, that affect dopamine transporter, improve behavior like hyperactivity, but mm -hmm. don't improve executive functions, and they can actually impair them. Low levels of stimulants have been what's been shown to improve prefrontal cortex function and improve executive functions. So we've been doing a study where we have people take executive function measures on their full dose of stimulant or on half the dose. And we're finding that for many people, on half the dose, they show better executive function because the doctor is judging the dose by the parent report of the child's behavior. The right. child parent says the child is less out of control. Nobody is giving the child any cognitive tests, any executive function measures to see how their executive functions are doing. So by targeting behavior, often doctors are over-medicating for the best executive functions. Wow, that's fascinating. It really is. Um... Any research on promoting executive functions in the elderly with ADHD? I know, I don't know. Do you have specific research on that? Um, the same thing works at any age. Things that challenge and train executive function help improve them at any age, especially if you really enjoy doing them. So crocheting is an example that would help in the elderly. Um, uh, any active, playing a musical instrument. Um, uh, any activity that challenges executive function will improve it at any age. It can be improved in babies and it can be improved in 90 year olds. The mm -hmm. same principles apply. Mm -hmm. uh, one woman here is asking, is my, is it my imagination or is my executive functions failing more at age 70? I'm female and I can't take stimulants anymore. I'm taking non-stimulants. Um, but I'm messing up more and more. Does age have anything to do also with uh, impaired executive functions? Yep. Yep. I'm <laughs> messing up more too. Yep. That just happens with aging. Working memory gets worse. Selective attention gets worse. It's harder to inhibit distraction. It's harder to remember um, what you were, what you were going to do or all the things on your to-do list. That's just natural aging. Okay. A lot of parents have asked about uh, IEPs and how to try to use some of this wisdom and insight and research that you've given with the IEP team to come up perhaps with accommodations that might be more targeted or more effective. Is, is there, do you have any advice to parents trying to convey some of this to an IEP team? Yes, there are two things. One is the scaffold and one is to challenge. So like I said, if you're having trouble with an executive function, it can help to scaffold it, it support that. So for example, research has shown that uh, kindergarten and first grade teachers love to decorate the walls of their classrooms with all these beautiful pictures and posters, mm -hmm. but young children are very distractible. And so they found that they learn better and are better able to play attention if the walls are more bare. 
because the bare walls scaffold them. It's not there. They don't have so much distraction in the room. Right. So you can ask that the school try to scaffold the, the ADHD child. So, for example, with more visual reminders of what he or she is supposed to be doing with with things chunked more. So it's not so overwhelming when they see everything in front of them. There are lots of things that can be done to support a, attention or working memory. And then the school also needs to recognize that in order to get better at these, the child needs to be challenged. And the best way to challenge them are, are activities that they enjoy and that work these activities like arts activities or sports. So martial arts, music, any of those what are called, you know, extra things, enrichment activities are what ADHD kids need. <laughs> And if they're ADHD combined type or hyperactive type, they also need ways to get rid of all their excess energy. Mm -hmm. So the, the sports and the physical activity are critical for them. And it's so sad to see schools taking it out because all the children benefit from them, not just ADHD children, but ADHD children particularly need these. Right. Um, how about the relationship of comorbid conditions like, let's say, anxiety and depression with um, executive function um, effectiveness. Yes. So there's a, a feedback loop going where feeling depressed and sad makes your executive functions worse and better executive functions help you reduce stress, but poorer executive functions are unable to help you reduce stress as much. So you have this unfortunate feedback loop going. But if you can make a change at any point in the loop, it affects the whole loop. So if you can find a way to get less depressed, to feel less stressed, um, whether it's uh, medication, whether it's mindfulness, whether it's a change in your routine, then that will also help improve your executive functions. And if you can find a way to improve your executive functions, it can help you better deal with the stress. So uh, unfortunately, it's a, a, a really unfortunate loop where it's self-reinforcing and the depression makes the executive function problem worse and the executive function problem makes the depression and anxiety worse. But if you can make a change at any point in there, it affects the whole loop. Wow. Very interesting. Um, some parents want to know when they can start, I think I know the answer, when they can start improving their child's executive functions. Is there a certain age or? Um, you, you can do it. You can do it from infancy. We've studied babies six to 12 months of age. And you can see them using executive functions and you can challenge their executive functions. Give them problems to solve. Like um, I did something where I put something that the baby wanted behind a, a clear wall. So the baby had a detour around to get it. And that was a real problem for the baby because their tendency is to want to reach straight for what they want. Or you put something slightly out of reach and see if they can use a cloth to pull it closer. Give them problems, challenge them, and don't uh, 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 make it too easy right away. So if a baby is trying to get something, you think, oh, he's trying, I can see what he's doing, I'll give it to him. Well, you just took the whole challenge away. Right, Let right. him try. Let him have the joy of having solved that challenge. Right. Great advice. Um, one parent is asking, are there specific recommendations you can make to challenge and improve cognitive flexibility? I know you, you, you had some, you obviously mentioned some on your slides, but um, like, is there anything else you can add or... For improving um, cognitive flexibility, um, the best thing is to to work on problems and trying to solve them from different angles. You know, um, how can I get the school to see the strengths of my child? How can I get the school to accommodate my child? My strategy isn't working. What else can I do to 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 succeed? What else can I do to help my child succeed? Um, Think outside the box and working on problems and trying to see them from different perspectives and trying to see the perspectives of other people so that maybe you can succeed better because you see it through their eyes. All mm -hmm. of that helps exec helps cognitive flexibility. Mm -hmm.
Here's a good one. Does caffeine help executive functions? I don't know. Okay. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Are there standard tests for children to see how executive functions are improving over time? That's a good question. We have tests for executive function. Most of them, though, aren't normed. And most huh. of them show practice effects. So you often get better just because you took the test before. Hmm. But there are measures. Um, the, the, one of the best is the Dallas Kaplan battery. There's another new test developed by Stephanie Carlson and um, Phil Zalazzo. That's uh, the Minnesota executive function test. Mm -hmm. That's normed. Um, both of them are normed. The Dallas Kaplan is also normed. So there are there are tests that you can give to to assess executive functions. We use tests to that we develop to assess executive functions, but our tests haven't been normed on large samples. Ah, okay. And finally, what role does sleep play in improving executive functions? If you're sleep deprived. Prefrontal cortex takes the first hit and the biggest hit. So the worst thing a student can do is to pull an all-nighter before an exam. Sleep makes executive functions worse. Sleep deprivation makes executive functions worse. So again, you see many people with ADHD have trouble sleeping, and so you have this feedback loop going, right? The, yes. the poor sleep makes their executive functions look worse. Um, so yes, anything that affects your health, or your, at, your mental or physical health affects prefrontal cortex and affects executive functions. Right. Well, Adele, I think the hour is up. Um, this was fabulous. I learned so much. I can't believe all the wisdom and research you brought to the table. So thank you for being here and agreeing to do this. Thank you for inviting me and thank the audience for their excellent questions. I enjoyed <laughs> it. Thanks very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. And our next free webinar will be on inattentive ADHD with Dr. Mary Salanto. We hope you can join us then on January 10th. Make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, articles, or research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com newsletters. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.